Welcome back to the Sid Rosenberg Show. You're a man that's been involved now with the, the, the last administration, both with Dick Cheney and Bush. You've worked alongside John Kasich. Uh, you've taught at Harvard. My new buddy, Ron Christie. What do you think about the whole disaster with Kelly? I'm sorry, Ron Christie. When you talk about a woman being bitchy and she's bleeding, you're talking about the vagina. Let's be honest, okay? So I don't believe that. Hey. I think he lied there. Well, what do you think? You think, you think he told uh, the truth? No. Look, you and I both know who's in charge in the relationship, and it's not us. <laughs> if I come home and said that sweet thing to my wife, are you kidding me? No way. <laughs> I probably wouldn't be talking to you now if I said that earlier. <laughs> no week. Are you kidding me? Right. It's Sid Rosenberg on 640 Sports. Newly released emails show Hillary Clinton and her State Department staff were sometimes frustrated when they couldn't share classified documents over her private Internet server. The department is in the process of releasing about 30,000 messages after it was discovered that Clinton used her home base server for official business while Secretary of State. Nancy Cordes went through the latest batch. The 4,400 emails reveal a Secretary of State who was deeply engaged in the minutia of diplomacy and fascinated by Washington intrigue. Gefilte Fish, where are we on this? She asked a pair of aides in 2010. The seemingly cryptic email referred to nine containers of carp caught up in a trade dispute. From longtime confidant Sidney Blumenthal, she got critiques of D.C. power brokers. Then White House senior advisor David Axelrod has enough to do fixing the domestic messes he's made. House Speaker John Boehner, he wrote, was an alcoholic and lazy. Boehner's office responded in a statement today, saying the only reason this mishandling of classified information has been exposed is because of Speaker Boehner's decision to create the Select Committee on Benghazi. 125 of the emails in this latest batch have been retroactively marked classified because the information in them is now considered too sensitive to release to the public. The new emails show Clinton chafed from time to time at the confines of a classified computer system that it could be difficult to access. In one exchange, her deputy chief of staff, Jake Sullivan, said he couldn't send her a statement from former British Prime Minister Tony Blair because it's on the classified system. Clinton responded, it's a public statement, just email it. Sullivan replied, trust me, I share your exasperation, but until Ops converts it to the unclassified email system, there is no physical way for me to email it. I can't even access it. The State Department says none of the newly released email information that was considered classified at the time that Clinton received it. Intelligence officials aren't so sure, Scott, and they say regardless, that material should not have been sitting on Clinton's home server for years. And you ask me what I want this year And I try to make this kind and clear Just a chance that maybe we'll find better days Cause I don't need boxes wrapped in strings And design a love and empty things Just a chance that maybe we'll find better days So take these words and sing Scott Pelley, CBS last night, doing the story on Hillary Clinton. Remember way back when, when it was a kind of a fait accompli, right, that it was going to be Bush and Clinton again, Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush. My next guest, well, I love this guy. I met him once, was on the Sean Hannity show with him and Tamara Holder in New York. I spent maybe an hour with this guy, but he has since uh, been on this program once. It's his second time back here. He's worked alongside Dick Cheney, George Bush, John Kasich, taught at Harvard, now teaches at Georgetown. He's a really smart guy. And he's African-American and he's conservative, which is something you don't find all that often. He's become one of my favorite guests. And uh, here he is, Ron Christie. Good morning, Ron. How are you, pal? Good. Good to talk to you, my man. Good to be with you. Great to have you back. Before we get into the whole Clinton thing there and Jeb Bush, I just uh, received a note on my desk, Ron. It reads this. The Democratic uh, Party is bringing Joe Biden down here to South Florida. He'll be at the JCC in Davie, Florida, which is about 
45 minutes south of where I am now, maybe an hour. And he's coming here. <laughs> you can't make this up. Uh, along with Debbie Wasserman Schultz to try to sell this Iranian deal to Jews. And I said this before, Ron. If you're a Jew, whether it's Schultz or the latest guy, Nadler, up in New York, and you're okay with this deal and voting for this deal, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you're not. It, it, it's anti, it Really, to me, it's anti-Semitism at its highest level. What are your thoughts on that? Couldn't agree with you more. I mean, you, you're talking about a regime that, uh, as this deal was being negotiated, was chanting death to America, death to Israel. You're talking about a regime who seeks to eradicate the very existence of the Jewish state. You're talking about our strongest ally in the region, Israel, and their steadfast commitment to democracy, their steadfast uh, commitment to uh, accept those who are fleeing from religious persecution. And this administration dares to free up to $100 billion to the largest sponsor of terrorism in the world. And Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Biden are trying to sell this deal. They should be trying to torpedo this deal because it's bad for America, it's bad for Israel, and I think it's going to lead to World War III with a nuclear Middle East. See, here's my issue. I understand, even though it's disgusting and it's gross and it's reprehensible, why Debbie would do it, because she's got something to gain politically. Who knows what Obama promised her or Nadler in New York or Biden, for that matter, but... For the average guy on the street, the guy living in Boca Raton, the guy living in, in D.C. where you are, Ron, or New York, a J- Jewish guy who goes to Temple on Saturday, how does that guy who's got nothing to gain politically from this creep Barack Obama, how does that guy vote, uh, vote, vote uh, is okay with that deal? Well, because they say, oh, you know, Obama's trying to do something that Bush couldn't do, Clinton couldn't do. This is historic. You know, we're finally going to have the mullahs in check when the reality check of this is, as you very well know, You can't have a regime in place that decides to inspect themselves, and that's exactly what the Iranians are going to do. They have 24 days to be notified of when they will have an inspection, and then, oh, by the way, the samples that they will give of the soil are collected by the Iranians themselves. So the average guy in the street looking at this thinking, oh, Obama is just so wonderful, oh, Obama, Obama, whereas a more objective person would say, this is so terrible for the United States and so terrible for the Middle East. This may be the worst deal. Would you say this is the worst deal in your existence? I don't know how old you are. You're about my age probably, right? Maybe 30s or 40s. The worst deal you've ever seen? Yeah. I'm 46. Okay. So you're, yeah, you're two years younger than me. Worst deal you've ever seen ever? No, actually, I think the worst deal I've ever seen was the appeasement uh, by Neville Chamberlain yeah. back in 1938, right. uh, thinking that he'd come back with a deal to preserve the peace for all time with Hitler, of course, which led to World War II. And by the way, you, um, you, you said that this Iran deal was analogous to that, and Chris Matthews uh, chewed your ass out on MSNBC for saying that. He did, which, you know, as much as I like Chris Matthews, uh, you know, any uh, comparison of the anointed one, to a weak, failed leader with uh, a weak foreign policy, uh, Chris couldn't handle that. And the truth of the matter is is that Obama is trying to negotiate a deal from a position of weakness. But as you know, for goodness sakes, a vast majority of the American people oppose this deal. The vast majority of the people in the House of Representatives and a number of the majority of the United States Senate oppose it. So Obama's doing this for Obama. He can't say he's doing it for the American people who reject his specklessness. I have a good buddy of mine. He's in sports, Ron Christie, up in New York. His name is Andrew Rosario. And I feel like I have to uh, preface it by saying he is African-American. And he was angry with me last night because I was taking Obama to task on a host of issues, Ron. The Iran deal, the racial tensions in this country, his failed foreign policy, the bullcrap numbers about the unemployment. That's not really indicative of where we are in, in, our, in our job market today. So many things that I think he has failed this country on. And he said, Sid, you, you got to wake up, man. This guy's going down as one of the the great presidents of all time, and he listed two or three things that he thought Obama's done a really good job on. Uh, what am I missing here? What, what, what is what is the left, what are these liberals trying to convince me of that I just don't see? What am I missing? Well, let's see, you're missing. You have 93 million people who are out of the workforce. You have the lowest job uh, workforce participation rate since the 1970s. You have, as you've noted, uh, a, a skewed uh, labor um, market with employment rate that is, is skewed by the government. We have African-American unemployment that's been above 10 percent for the entire Obama presidency. You have greater numbers of Americans who are in poverty since he came into office in 2009. And the list goes on and on. (laughs) This has nothing to do with the color of his skin. It has to deal with his lack of confidence, of understanding about leadership and how government works. Well, let me talk about the color of his skin, though, for a second, because that has come up here. And what what has been said, Ron, and 
uh, whether it's fair or unfair, that's what you're here to tell me, is Michael Brown wasn't a good kid, okay? And uh, But he was there for him, Barack Obama, and in fact made sure that guy Wilson never worked again. And listen, Zimmerman is a piece of garbage, we know that, but Trayvon Morton wasn't a good kid. And it just seems like every time one of these events happens, and an African-American is, uh, is, is a victim here, I guess you can say, that Barack Obama is there. But when a white officer is gunned down execution style at a gas station in Texas on Saturday, he's more interested in renaming a mountain in Alaska. That may be unfair, but I will tell you that is the continuous Tension and now uh, conventional wisdom of a lot of white folks and some black in this country. Is that unfair or somewhat accurate? No, it's not unfair. I think it's very accurate. You know, Obama sent several representatives to, to Michael Brown's funeral, uh, a criminal who attacked a police officer. Uh, there is no evidence whatsoever that race had anything to do with that. And yet you have this Black Lives Matter, this garbage, this nonsense that has arisen across the United States where they say, you know, cops should, should uh, taste should fry like bacon. And what do we see? We've seen 25 police officers murdered this year, and the president is largely mom and not there at all. You have Kate Steinle, a poor girl from my beloved hometown of San Francisco, who was killed by a illegal immigrant who had been deported several times. Why? Because Obama supports sanctuary cities. And so this president is more interested in looking at people based on the color of their skin or their victim status rather than equally applying the law said to all of us, regardless of our, our ethnicity, our skin color, and say, we're Americans, we all deserve to be treated the same. What does your family say? Well, I mean, I, again, Ron Christie here, you're uh, African-American, your family for the most part, if not all, Democrats, which is normal. All of them. They, 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 are they not, when they hear you say something like this, do they get furious with you? Oh, they pull their hair out, and, and you know, <laughs> they're, 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 <laughs> they're down your way. They're in Siesta Key, and I tell you, uh, I grew up as a Republican not because everybody else who was black in my family was a Democrat, but because those are the ideas that I believed in. And my my family would look at me there like, well, you know, 90-something percent of African Americans are Democrat. And I right. say, I'm not African American. I am a Californian first. I'm an American second right. who happens to be black, right. period. Right, right. No, they say the same thing about the Jews. I mean, the, we, we have been uh, Democrats for forever, forever and ever. And Listen, I'm not, I'm not a Republican either. You really are, compared to me, you're much more conservative. I am very liberal uh, when it comes to social views, but I'm certainly not a Democrat either. I just wonder when we'll get to the point where it's going to be enough of, well, black people are mostly Democrats and Jews are mostly Democrats. And when we get to the point, Ron, when people start to figure out what's really duty and what's really good dive of chocolate, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Boy, I love that analogy. <laughs> well, I think it's going to take a different leader with a different tone who reminds us, and I, I, I hate to say it, but it reminds me of Ronald Reagan, who was always optimistic, had a, had a sunny disposition, always believed in the best in America, as opposed to this president who is petty, petulant, and believes that just because you're a certain color or you're a certain uh, faith that you're a victim. And this victimization of Americans, I think, more than anything else, is being told that if you act out, if you are irresponsible, that it's, it's Whitey's fault. It has done so much destruction to this country in the last eight years that we just need to turn the page and get a new leader with a new set of fresh ideas that reminds us of why we live in the greatest country in the world. And two of those people, Ron, I think uh, a lot of people thought they were the consensus to win. Uh, Bush Clinton all over again, right? Hillary Clinton, she's going to win the left by a distance. Jeb Bush is going to win the right. Here we go. And you said to me yesterday, as I spoke to you about this upcoming appearance, uh, that may have been the case way back when. You're at the point right now where you think neither is going to represent their party. Isn't that right? Yeah, it is right. And, you know, we, we had this exchange yesterday. It's so interesting that a year ago, conventional wisdom, frankly, the, the, the odds-on wisdom would say, well, Clinton's got it all locked up. It was, it was Obama's time last time. Now it's time for Hillary Clinton, time for the first woman. And on the Republican side, well, Jeb has paid his dues, and he's got the establishment locked up you know, right behind him. But I think what we've seen with Bernie Sanders, the senator from Vermont, and with Donald Trump, who needs no introduction, is that mm. Americans are tired of the establishment. Americans are tired of the Washington you know, this is how we always do things sort of attitude. And I think if this campaign progresses, said you're going to see people look at other candidates and they're going to look at someone who is beyond the beltway and they're going to look for someone who has demonstrated leadership. Not to suggest that Jeb Bush doesn't. I think he's a nice guy. But I just think that the time has passed where Americans are going to say, in a country of nearly 330 million people, 
can't we find someone with a last name other than Bush or Clinton to be a standard bearer? <laughs> right. No, I agree. So, but the question becomes, look, I'm in the Trump camp right now, and I say that reluctantly every time somebody asks me because, you know, I know that it's kind of a silly thing, He's, but, but I'm in his camp right now. But I will admit this. I just had this conversation with Joe Theismann, who was a, a great quarterback in your city, Ron, and he's kind of in the Trump uh, camp too, but not really. He's not endorsing anybody yet because he says some of the things that Trump says are silly. We like it. It's fun. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's loud and it works, but it's silly. Has Donald Trump really said anything to you during this time where he's uh, doing really, really well, obviously, although Ben Carson's catching up. Has he said anything to you that you can take practical material and go, hey, that's going to work? Yeah, I, I have. I, I look at what he said about building a wall with Mexico. I mean, we could do this. It's the statute that's on the law said that we must do this. And the politicians on both sides of the aisle ignore it. Why? Because they want cheap labor in the United States, and they think, well, we'll just sort of thumb our nose to the statute, and we'll get what we want, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce will back us, and we'll be reelected. Donald Trump, I believe, if he was president and he said that he'd build a wall, he'd build a wall. We need to build a wall, right. pure and simple. Right. And he'd get it done. I have no doubt he'd get it right. done. I don't agree with a lot of his tactics and a lot of his antics, but what Donald Trump speaks to, which these establishment politicians don't understand, if he's authentic, you know he means what he says. There's no doubt about it. Why do you think Ben Carson all of a sudden has gained this immense popularity? He has now tied Donald Trump in Iowa. He's clearly in second place right now. Uh, what do you think is going on with Ben Carson? Same thing. I, I think Dr. Carson is authentic. I think unlike Barack Obama, Carson comes across as being a very sincere man, a very serene man, and a remarkably intelligent man. And when you listen to what he has to say and you look at his story, literally from being rags to riches, from being you know, dirt poor with no money to being a brilliant neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins, people say, if this guy isn't the embodiment of the, the American dream, I don't know who is. Mm. And, and I think he, he resonates with a yearning of people who believe said, you know what, if I really do work hard and I try my best, I can mm. succeed. And Carson is the embodiment of that. He's uh, the most likable guy, I believe, uh, in this campaign. I just, I like him. Something about, I don't know him, but I like him. Uh, Carly Fiorina, the left will tell you, is a miserable bitch. I hate to use that word, but she is. She costs a lot of people a lot of money at Hewlett Packard. She did some really nasty things along the way. And yet guys like me on the right go, yeah, but she was really good in that debate. And I think she's really, really smart and a really good candidate. Once again here, what am I missing with Carly Fiorina, who looks like now with CNN amending the the rules here will, in fact, be part of the next big debate two weeks from tonight. Well, she's the real deal. Uh, Kayla Packard is headquartered in my hometown of Palo Alto, and I've watched her career for, for many, many years now. And I, I served on a board uh, with her at the American Conservative Union, which puts on CPAC. She's the real deal. She really is the real deal. Mm. Yes, she was thrown out in a boardroom brawl at Kayla Packard. Yes, uh, the money, uh, the company lost mo money if they were going through a restructuring. But you can't deny that she is remarkably intelligent. She's quick on her feet. She has executive experience, and she knows how to mix it up. And I, I think that once more Americans get the chance to get to know her a little better in the next debate, I think you'll see her numbers continue to rise. She's another one that's not a politician. Two or three more will let you run, but you're so damn good, Ron. i got, I got to keep you on the show. Um, she's not a politician. <laughs> Carson's not a politician. Donald Trump is not a politician. The next guy in the GOP order that's getting some play, he is a politician, is Ted Cruz. What do you think about that? I like Senator Cruz. I think Senator Cruz is the anti-establishment. I mean, you listen to him talk about how uh, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell lied on a number of things, that were ranging from repeal of Obamacare, ranging uh, of, of a way to, to sort of reject this Iran deal. And Cruz resonates with people because they actually believe what he says, and they are tired of what's going on in Washington. And Cruz is your anti-establishment candidate, even though he's on the inside. He's trying to fight the inside from the outside. Chris Christie says, watch out. You know, last debate, they won 20 consecutive questions without talking to me. And he said it pissed him off. He said, if I go 15, you can count them at home, folks. If I go 15 this debate, I'm going to go nuclear. Uh, was that an empty threat or what? <laughs> no, I just... You know, I want to like Chris Christie. I was born in New Jersey. We're not related. You're shocked, I know. Um, <laughs> it's about the same way, too, so it's possible. <laughs> uh, you know, you never know. Um, but you're talking about a Republican governor uh, that has one of the highest uh, income tax rates in the United States. The books are not balanced there. Stagnant 
people are moving out of the state. I just don't think he has a very compelling case. As, as much as I want to like him with our, our same last name, uh, of really That's being funny. a viable candidate. Now, on the other hand, uh, your guy, who you did work for, I'll tell you a quick story. Chuck Todd, I talked to Chuck Todd before and after every Meet the Press. I, uh, we were good buddies, and, and I love the guy. Anyway, make a long story short, we were going back and forth about some of the candidates on Sunday, and he said, you know, Sid, he goes, he's on my show every Friday, too. He goes, based upon your ideology, what you believe in politically, he goes, the guy for you, without a shadow of a doubt, is John Kasich. Now, you worked many years for John Kasich, I believe almost uh, eight years, and he's a complete yep. antithesis of Chris Christie in that he really did save Ohio. What about John Kasich moving forward? Well, you're looking at a governor who took a multi-billion dollar deficit and turned it into a $2 billion surplus, someone who received 26% of the African-American vote, who won 86 out of 80 counties, uh, 88 counties in Ohio and has a 61% approval rating. Wow. That kind of tells you that he resonates beyond the Republican base, that he resonates to people of color, to women, to union households. And you're right. In full disclosure, I worked for him for nearly eight years. But I can tell you, this is someone, when you look at Obama, who looks at America based in terms of black and white, and religion and this and that, Kasich sees people as people. And the more that people get to hear from him and the more they get to interact with him, I think his numbers will continue to go up. But it's make or break for him in New Hampshire. If he does yes. well in New Hampshire, I think his candidacy goes on. Yep. If he doesn't, I think he packs it in. I think you nailed it. Last one. Let's go back to the other side for a second. We we started. And we didn't start the conversation, but midway through, you talked about how last year, the conventional wisdom a year ago today, Bush and Clinton, neither's going to win in your estimation. Uh, tell me that. If it's not Hillary, who's it going to be? Well, I'm looking for a surprise candidate. I don't think it's going to be Joe Biden. I don't think it's going to be Bernie Sanders. I'm looking for someone who is a, a governor, not unlike 1992, where we had Bill Clinton come out of nowhere from Arkansas, and someone who's going to catch fire. I'm not quite sure who that is right now, but I, I think the similarities between this election cycle and 1992 are very similar. Yeah. You're going to find someone who's going to say, you know what, Hillary's not getting it done. Uh, Sanders will really implode. The Republicans will walk away with this. I'm going to get in, and it yeah. will change the dynamic. Well, it's not, listen, now Biden can't beat her. Whether he jumps in or not, he can't beat her. Let's be honest. I don't know about Liz Warren, but I'll give you a name that my good buddy Bernard McGurk from the IMA show, that's why I met you. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was working with Bernard that, those couple of days, filling in for Geraldo. He seems to think uh, if this Iran deal does go through, and it looks like it may, which is really sickening, that at that point, John Kerry jumps in. Your thoughts there? wouldn't surprise me. I mean, Kerry, uh, from the folks that I know on the Democratic side of the aisle, say he still stings from the defeat uh, of George W. Bush and get back in 2004 and hasn't given up the dream of becoming president. I think Kerry, uh, like the deal or not, and I think it's atrocious as to you, will say, I have more foreign policy experience than anybody in the field. I was Secretary of State. I was in the military. And I was in the United States Senate and chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I think he could make a compelling case. Whether he could beat a Republican is another story. But right. I definitely think he's one that people should be keeping their eye on. Well, he can. I mean, he had, he had George Bush right for the taking that second time around. I still couldn't get it done. <laughs> I remember that very, very well. Hey, tell me this, Ron. You know, for folks, because uh, I got to tell you, I'm being honest here. Uh, last time you were on this show, you got a ton of great feedback. And they're like, you know, I don't really know. What can I find more of Ron Christie? Are you on with Sean every single week and, and TV? What are you doing on a regular basis? Media well, I tend to join. I tend to join Sean's uh, show on the radio about every other week with our buddy Camera Holder. Uh, you can find me most days. I'm on television four or five times a week. I tend to do uh, CNN on Monday and Friday mornings, and then throw in a little Fox Business and Fox News Channel throughout the rest of the week. Who do you do? Uh, uh, is, is that is that with Chris Cuomo with Berman? Uh, the show before. Um, no, this is this is Carol Costello gotcha. on, uh, right. on CNN, right. uh, usually in the, the 10 o'clock hour. Yeah. But you can learn more. You can follow me on Twitter. You can go to Ron, uh, at Ron underscore Christie. You can go to, to ChristieStrategies.com on the web. Uh, three books out uh, talking about the intersection of race and politics. And then uh, to cap it all off, I teach at Georgetown University, as you noted, and I'm on their advisory board for the Institute of Politics and Public Service. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do my best to mm-hmm. – engage people to to talk with folks and to learn from people about how can we not only return stability to our political discourse but how can we rebuild some of the problems that this president's left us i've had three conversations with you one uh, when i met you in person for sean hannity's show and two on this show since and i gotta tell you i love you and, and i want you to keep talking because you're smart 
and uh, and you're not biased. And uh, what you have to say always, whether people agree or disagree, you state it so well and and with, with love, really. Not you're not an angry guy. That we love having you on, and we just uh, thank you, Ron Christie, and no. another great job. Well, I love joining you, Sid, and you and I made an instant connection when we met, and I think you can always tell when you found a kindred spirit and we found each other, and uh, I will come back anytime you invite me, and, and, you know, let's hang out next time you're either in New York or D.C. or I make it down your way. You got it. I will definitely call you. You're great. We love you. That is an excellent job. He's become uh, really, uh, maybe my favorite, I don't know, maybe my favorite. Right there with Chuck Todd, that is Ron Christie, and... um, you can check him out in all those all those different places, CNN, Sean Hannity, his websites, and he's got a lot to say, and he's a brilliant guy. 888-640-9385, pretty good hour there. Former Redskin quarterback Joe Theismann talking about the demotion of RG3 and then his thoughts on the political races and China and the Wall Street and all that good stuff. Then about 20 minutes with Ron Christie, still lots more to do. Former NFL kicker for 20 years. He was in the courtroom on Monday standing beside giant owner John Mara, Tom Brady, Roger Goodell, right there for the latest NFL talks as we wait the verdict finally on Brady and the NFL. Jay Feely, former Dalton kicker too, Jets and Giants. He'll be here at 9. And then uh, Major League Baseball Hall of Famer, one of the all-time greats, Tony La Russa, here at 9.30. So lots more to come. Uh, stick around. More on a Wednesday right after this. Get on the show. Call now. 888-640-9385. It's Sid Rosenberg on 640 Sports. Swung on and driven a deep right field. Fair, it's gone. And let's see. It is a fair ball. Gardner plants one into the right field seats right past the pesky bowl. Gardy goes yardy. And the Yankees take a 3-1 lead. Rick Gardner added a little bit of insurance with that home run. Did that one run seem almost bigger than it than it was because of how much of a pitcher's duel it had been? Well, I think so. And, you know, where they were in their order. And, you know, these guys have been swinging the bats good. I mean, they were I think they were third in the American League in run scored in the month of August. And, um, you know, I thought our pitchers did a really good job. But that run seemed like a lot. And the pitch is a half swing. He struck him out swinging. Ball game over. Yankees win. The Yankees win. With Pineda, you said he threw the ball well. What was the biggest difference from the past couple of starts? Because he really struggled the last few times out. Yeah, I just think his command was good. I thought he was pretty good down and away tonight. I thought his slider was good. Um, I thought it was pretty sharp. And, uh, you know, he just he made his pitches. He made his pitches when he had to. Swung on, hit high and deep, down the left field line, towards the corner. Conforto, he's out of room. It's gone. A three-run home run for Darren Ruff. It's his seventh of the year. And the Phillies, again, hang a five spot on Jonathan Neese. It's 5 nothing here in the third inning. Three straight now for John where he struggled. What have you seen throughout these three that's changed? Well, Again, when we talked about when he was pitching so well, it was about making pitches. You know, he was his sinker was working, his two-seamer was working. He was getting the cutter in on guys. He was using his change-up. And, you know, he's just leaving balls on the plate. That's two games in a row where, you know, in, big, in a big situation, he's hung two curved balls to rough and, you know, gotten hurt by it. Blanco swings and drives one hard to right center on the run. Granderson, he won't get it. Frank Cor and Ruff both score. Blanco cruising into second with a two-run double. And the Phillies now lead this one 13-4, a seven-run sixth inning. It's their biggest inning of the season. you got to forget them. I mean, you know, it just obviously we had two brutal innings. Um, so we'll uh, regroup and come back tomorrow and get them. Former pro wrestler Jimmy Superfly Snuka found fame in the ring, but now faces infamy outside of it. The 72-year-old is charged in a decades-old cold case murder of his girlfriend, Nancy Argentino. Longtime neighbors in Atco, Camden County, describe Snuka as quiet, friendly, and a shadow of the hulky physique he displayed during his wrestling days. I can't imagine it, but like I said, he's, he's been a nice guy ever since I've known him. Jimmy Snuka had long been suspected of killing his girlfriend, who died after being found unconscious in a Lehigh Valley motel in 1983. Investigators say they reopened the case amid Snuka's conflicting accounts of what happened that night. And that led to a Lehigh County grand jury filing third-degree murder and involuntary manslaughter charges against him. Repeatedly assaulted Nancy Argentina on May 10, 1983, and then allowed her to lie in their bed at the George Washington Motor Lodge 
without obtaining the necessary medical attention. The home he shares with his wife in ADCO remained quiet. Those who knew the legendary wrestler at the height of his career say they're in disbelief at how far he's fallen. From the air and on the ground, a massive, intensive manhunt for the killers of a veteran police officer. SWAT teams, canine units, all closely searching nearby wooded areas, local businesses and homes. The suspects are considered armed and dangerous. They're being described as two male whites and one male black. We have the uh, evidence processing at the scene, and we have the investigation into exactly what occurred here today. Shots were fired. Officer is down. Authorities say the officer was on routine patrol and radioed that he was checking on suspicious activity. He was on a foot pursuit when communication was lost. Moments later, backup arrived. They found the officer shot, his gun and pepper spray gone. The officer, Charles J. Glenowitz, was a 32-year veteran of law enforcement, a husband and father of four sons. Residents in here knew him as G.I. Joe, and we remember him as someone deeply committed to Fox Lake. His death, a scene that has become all too familiar. This year alone, 84 officers have been killed in the line of duty. That's up 15% compared to this time last year. Many in law enforcement really feel like uh, they're in greater danger now. As the manhunt in Fox Lake continued, commuter trains were shut down, schools on lockdown, and a warning issued for residents. Please be on the alert. Anything out of the ordinary, anything they're not used to seeing in their subdivisions. Uh, no tip is too small, uh, and we're asking for the community's help on locating anything suspicious. Uh, so pleased to bring you breaking news. CNN has amended its rules for the debate in which I will be participating as a panelist on, uh, on September 16th. And the person most likely to benefit from that amendment is joining me now live on the line, Carly Fiorina. Hello, Carly. Welcome. It's good to have you back. Well, thank you so much, Hugh. And I, really, I am calling to say thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you to all your listeners. You know, uh, your listeners put a lot of pressure on CNN and CNN responded. Good for them. Good for the RNC. Thank you so much. Well, I think CNN made a very solid news decision. I have Mark Preston coming on after the break to discuss it. What's your reaction, though, and how does it change, if anything, what Carly Fiorina is doing to prepare for the Reagan Library debate? Well, obviously now we know who we're going to be on the stage with. That's helpful. <laughs> That's helpful. And um, I really look forward to the debate. I look forward to having a substantive conversation, and I know that's what we will have because you, you, you are one of the moderators. I look forward to having a substantive conversation about the issues that face our nation with the other front runners, which is what now, we does this have more of, not less of. Does this instantly become a Trump Fiorina showdown? Well, I don't know about that, but certainly Trump is the front runner. And so... He is someone that I look forward to discussing and debating with. Now, it, it, since the announcement was made by CNN about an hour ago, I'm sure you've been deluged with calls from all the national news media. Did their amendment uh, explanation make as much sense to you as it did to me? Well, it does make sense, because basically what they acknowledge is that in this particular cycle, unlike apparently other cycles, there were just too few polls after the August 6th debate as compared to the number of polls before the August 6th debate. I mean, we can argue about whether national polls are the right polls. I happen to think state polls are more relevant because, after all, we have a state primary system, not a national primary system. On the other hand, a poll came out today, PPP, on number four. It's pretty clear that I'm in the top five. And so... I think they made the right decision based on the data, which clearly has shifted, in my case, dramatically from prior to August 6th to post-August 6th. Yeah, well, but again, on the another important point with Trump is the political correctness issue. Uh, the other candidates uh, are just a little weak on that, particularly uh, Carly. Uh, uh, you know, she jumped in and supported uh, Meg. Uh, Kelly uh, against Trump uh, uh, and uh, played the, uh, you know, feminist victim. Well, you know, that's that's the solidarity of the vaginas. Yeah, yeah. Well, we need to fight this political correctness. Oh, oh, into... Wait a second now. The, the, the vaginas have monologues. <laughs> we know this. There was a play. All right, bleep it. Let's not even play it. Just, just Mike just hit the bleep up. <laughs> No, it's not too late. We didn't. We haven't gone anywhere. You telling me it's too late to bleep it now? 
Anyway, we need to fight political correctness. Mike, are you yanking my chain? You 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 weren't able to bleep that. Oh come on, we've got. I can't give a you 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 just didn't because you wanted that out there. All right, look at vagina monologues. This is a female solidarity. It's all it was. Everybody knows I'm a big Carly fan, so just lighten up. It's a joke, folks. Limbaugh. I didn't know, like I said, 6 o'clock this morning. I had no idea vagina was a bad word, but I guess Rush Limbaugh was like all freaked out yesterday. He didn't dump that mic. I said vagina. I said vagina monologue. and He was panicking. Yeah. Talking about vagina, here's um, Chelsea Taylor, who's on the WIRK morning show. On my my air, I don't Uh, think. You can't say that? I don't think so. What can you say on your show? I'll come over here because I I like that. I'm I'm all day, all day. Yeah, you don't mind saying that? No. A lot of girls don't like to say vagina. They they, they say it sounds ugly from a guy, but even worse from a girl. I don't know why they would think that. It's not a pretty word, but it's not a pretty word. I don't think so. No, not used often in your household. You got a little kid too, don't you? Yes, I don't exactly call my seven-year-old a vagina. Right. <laughs> I, believe, I believe parents frown upon it. <laughs> That's what I hear, though. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be on YouTube. Can I ask you an honest question? Yes. Yes, I have a vagina. Okay, I know you've got one. Sorry. Yeah. Um, what do you guys talk about there? Like, I, I know you play country music, right? Yield, yield. You've got three people. You've got JD, you've got Tiny, you've uh-huh. got you, okay? Yeah. What what is the comp? Is it in and around the the groups, the songs? What do you talk about? We talk about pretty much anything that's like going on in the world, stuff that's going on in our lives. We all are very different yeah. over there, so you know a lot of things about what we have going on in our lives, how other people can relate and deal with things. You know, mm-hmm. what do you got going on in your life that's uh, you think is relatable? Just curious. Well, like, for example, yesterday we talked about how over the weekend I got what I like to call sympathy flowers. Oh, really? What was that about? The, I'm sorry, I'm going to screw up this weekend. Here are the flowers to remind you how much I love you. Kind oh, of flowers. that's your uh, boyfriend. Your fiance. fiance. Yes, right. yes. Right. He had like tr- he had like 10 of his college guy friends like come oh. into town. Yeah. And he knew that obviously stuff would go awry. So <laughs> on Sunday morning, <laughs> yeah. I get these like, I love you, Muffy flowers. I'm like, huh. so you, what did you do? Right. And that's not a reason to send flowers, just so you know, people. Well, listen, uh, the, and I don't know your, your fiancé, and I hope you guys are happy oh, no, he's, forever. He's great. But usually you send flowers and you've done something uh, irreparably wrong. I'm just... Right. Yes. Because here's right. the thing. It'd be <laughs> right. one thing it'd be, it'd be one thing if I got them all the time, but when you don't get them all the time and right. they just show up, right. then you've just like said I'm guilty. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. We have a sex therapist on every Tuesday morning. She's world-renowned. She's on the Howard Stern Show, our show, oh, very yeah? popular. She said that, and this is the God's honest truth, Chelsea, and you could uh, you could uh, confirm this. Yes, Eric, you could affirm this. I will. She said if she walked into her house and she found her boyfriend in bed with somebody else, that as a therapist, as a therapist, yeah. the right thing to do, you're not going to believe this, is to actually kick that person out, get undressed, jump into the bed, and finish what that person was doing because obviously the boyfriend was looking for something you're not giving him, so it's it's her job at that point it's to jump fault. in. It's your fault. It's your fault. This is on you. Right. What do you think about something like that? Is that crazy to you? Or? Yeah, that is weird to me. <laughs> so you wouldn't do that? So, no. Yeah, right. But, but then know, again, but, right. I'm giving it enough. You don't need any more. <laughs> good God, if you need more, then you need help. Right. Oh, you're good like that. So what are you worried about then? He didn't do anything wrong this weekend. He probably had a couple of drinks and all that. Oh, huh? yeah, I did. It's fine. Yeah. But still, it's just like... Here, when are you getting married? What, what date? Uh, April 23rd, really? 2016. Is he not coming to the wedding? You may as well invite him. You want to go to the wedding? He'll give you a you nice gift. You want to go? Okay, great. Here's what you have to do. You, uh, I tell this to this idiot. He's getting married in two weeks. He has 11 people coming to the wedding. You oh, inv- my God. I'm so jealous. You really. invite people that you know are not going to come, and they'll still give you a gift. Aren't you paying for your own wedding? Dude, we have 300 uh, people. I got 311, so. On yeah. this list. Oh, Jeez. my God. It's like, yeah. 
I've got my my husband is like my fiance is like Groomzilla. Yeah. I have got spreadsheets he sends me every day. <laughs> the mother liquor's got a Pinterest board. I'm just like I am like the dude. I'm like yeah. just tell me where to get a dress and yeah. I'll show up. And that's it. And like oh my god, he's yeah. so he's so the woman. Anybody yeah. famous coming? Is Tim McGraw coming to the party or Jason Aldean or something? I wanted Brett Eldridge to sing our wedding song. That's we're awesome. trying to make that work. Really? He'll be down here um, and stuff like that. So we're yeah. trying to we're trying to make that work. Well, we'll what see. are you gonna do for that, uh, Eric? Who's singing your wedding song? I'm just curious. I don't know the way. Somebody. <laughs> we'll find somebody. The valet guy can also sing. Yeah. Who you know, knew? I have these two great friends, Michelle and Bobby Stallone. They are Stallone's Italian restaurant, West Boca. They yeah. are the first cousin of Sly Stallone. Oh. Well, Sly is his hero. Uh, no, all kidding aside, right or wrong, is that your hero? Yes, he's my guy. So I'm Sylvester trying to convince Stallone. them to invite Sly to come into town and go to his wedding. That'd be pretty awesome. Yeah, but Sly said no chance. I mean, no chance. Zero chance. So be, I mean, if you had one person right now, right now, that could be at your wedding in April, who would that person be? Uh, one person. This would be, listen, it could be completely unrealistic. One person. Could be Obama. Could be... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what the heck did I just walk into? <laughs> Honestly, you know who I'd like? I'd yeah. love to have Blake Shelton in my wedding because that Shelton. mother can party. Yeah, he can, and he's available now, too. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I don't want him like that. That, that is a threesome waiting he to happen right a there. Gi- he is a gigantic human being. He's a big boy. And yeah. actually, it's funny because yeah. my fiance is 6'4". He's you're, you're, a big dude. You know, your fiance kind of looks like Blake Shelton a little bit, weird. to be honest. And he's a big dude. Yeah. But I have a picture of us with Blake, yeah. and it makes Bo look like a little minion. He does, right. Blake looks yeah. like an alien. Blake's His a big head boy. is ginormous. Yeah. But he's so a cool guy. He looks, he he looks like he'd be cool. a lot of fun. He'd be fun. All right, so when is this uh, This big Lady Ante? I happen to love Lady Antebellum. When is this big I do concert? Too. Honestly, this show took me by. I saw them, I think two years ago, they were down at the Hard Rock. Nice. And we went down there like, ah, we're just going to go check them out. I wasn't like that pumped about it. The most surprising show I've ever seen. That good? Lo- that good. Wow. They are awesome. Really? So they're rolling into town with Hunter Hayes and Sam Hunt. Hunter Hayes is that young kid, the blonde haired kid. Who can play he guitar can like you've never seen right and he's a pretty good singer really impressive and a great songwriter and sam hunt who's got the number one song out right now on country radio with house party so they're rolling look at all these facts i'm just laying down hello hello (laughs) what do you do for a living (laughs) um i just work country radio (laughs) so anyway they're rolling into town on sunday which is kind of cool because then you got labor day on monday of a full day to recover and you get to get wasted on a sunday and are you gonna be there Uh, there. not that you need an excuse to get wasted on a sunday by the way the more i've learned about you you, it's you don't need a concert for that it's (laughs) it's a wednesday (laughs) right okay but but are you going to be there again with the truck yep. and all that I'll stuff? I'll be and there. We, uh, we broadcast live out there from 3 to 7. We're having everybody stop by. Cool. We broadcast and we interview all of them, and then we'll stay for the show and, awesome. and whatnot. Yeah. You should go, Z. I'm telling you, man. Can you smoke weed out there? Is that cool? I cannot confirm nor deny <laughs> that the Perfect Vodka Amphitheater <laughs> supports that. Are you serious right no, now? No, that's serious. He smokes a lot of... Both of my stop. guys smoke a lot of weed. No, I just, is that a roundup shirt? Hothead fuckers. Yes, it is. <laughs> I live like a My minute, rounds a are minute up. from oh, there. God. No, I mean, live like literally behind. Yeah, right he behind lives right up. behind Roundup. No, this is a rib Roundup. This is our oh. country country. Rib Roundup, Sweet yeah. Jesus, come, come over here and let me hit Right, you. right. That's, that's cool. That, no, all I saw was the back. I saw Roundup. That's so the like, better chili cook off right there. That's the better Thank one. you. Ah, yeah, yes. okay, okay. The rib right. Roundup. We're, we're making a habit. Don't of worry. This. You'll drink the Kool Aid sooner enough. Just I didn't Guyana. Spike that for you. We make a habit of this now. Anytime we've got tickets to give away, Tim McGraw and our Lady Antebellum, we want you to give away the tickets because when you tweet it out, there, the, the, my, my fans love you, obviously. Oh, well, so, thank you for having me. Uh, you're welcome. Give I'm us a special. number right now. What number wins these uh, tickets? Number nine. Number nine. Any any reason why you picked number nine? Because because you asked me to give you a number, <laughs> and that was all I could come up with. Fair Sweet Jesus. <laughs> okay. What else am I supposed to Well, do? I thought maybe the nine meant something no, to you. No, it means nothing to me. Nothing nine to is dead to me. Number I don't know what to tell you. I don't know. <laughs> all right. We'll use number nine, and uh, we look forward to the next pair of tickets we're giving away, because you're great, so I, thank you. Thank you. I thank will, you. Uh, the, my bill is in the mail. Okay. okay well, look for your <laughs> inbox. I'm, I'm sending it. This was five minutes. Perfect. That'd what is great. your Twitter uh, handle, too, for folks who are At uh, Chelsea Taylor 6. Chase, that is such a why freaking number six? lie. Chelsea what, what W-I-R-K. You? I'm sorry. It's Chelsea okay, W-I-R-K. There you what go. an idiot. <laughs> uh, Chelsea Taylor 6. A uh, 6 was my lacrosse number in high school, and sometimes you just don't let it go. Right. Sure. Yeah, that's why. I know exactly what I you're saying. I was an all-American lacrosse player. Right. I like to live in the glory days still, so <laughs> right. I still hold on to my number I for gotcha. like 15 years. Why don't we make a call to number 6, then, instead of number 9? 
nine. Six last time. Oh, I was you're, here. you're right. God so now you've used six and nine. I'm trying to no big surprise there, Chelsea. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> thank you. You were great. Oh, thanks thank for you. having me. All right. I hate your shirt. I love one, you. Thank you. 103.1 uh, FM W I R K. That is the yes. musical stylings of the I'm very lovely go back Chelsea and do Taylor. My job over there. Okay, hop on over there. I can't say vagina over there, so I'm gonna say it here one more right. time. Vagina. Listen, uh, you, you admit this right now. Given what? the opportunity, everything being equal, what? and I changed all of my rejoin music to country music. No rock and roll. None of that stuff. Everything being equal, same money, if not more. You're here for four hours instead of there. Where are you? I like you. You see, you're here. I do like you. I but, hate your shirt, but right. I like you. But then again, I work with a freaking Jets fan oh, over there. So I go through a lot emotionally. <laughs> are you mentally. a Gator fan or a Seminole fan? A Gator. I went to UF. You did go to UF. I okay. Did. Yeah. I don't want really to care about this team. I, I did. Just... I have my master's in finance and I ended up in radio. Shoot for the stars, people. Shoot for the stars. That's funny because I went to school for accounting and business degree also and ended up in this thing too. Wow, so we're yeah. really winning. It's together, a waste of time we? for me yeah. too. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, all right. There it is. Call number nine right now. 888-640-9385. A pair of tickets to see Lady at the Bellum Hunt. Hunter Hayes and Sam Hunt. Sunday night. Where is that concert? Perfect Vodka Amphitheater. Always is. A courtesy of Chelsea Taylor and WIRK. Jay Feely, NFL kicker. Next.